My guest today is Susan Pierce Thompson, PhD. She's an adjunct associate professor of brain and cognitive sciences at the University of Rochester and an expert in the psychology of eating. She is president of the Institute for Sustainable Weight Loss and CEO of Bright Line Eating Solutions, a company dedicated to sharing the psychology and neuroscience of sustainable weight loss. Hey, Dr. Thompson, welcome to the show. Hi, so good to be with you. It's yeah, exciting. Yeah, I'm, I'm so excited. I've really been looking forward to this. Um, so I wanted to start, so obviously today we're going to talk about weight loss. It's such a huge issue for so many people. It's become this huge crisis in the U.S. and you know, throughout the world now, um, mm -hmm. as I'm sure. We've exported it. <laughs> yes, we've, we've yeah. exported it, among other things, unfortunately. Um, and I wanted to start by hearing a little bit of your personal story, because I know this is an issue that you struggled with for a long time. Um, can you share with us maybe an anecdote or two of, of what your personal struggle was like and then how, how you came to the breakthrough? So many, I mean, like, so I'll remember, I remember I, I, okay, so I was a drug addict and now looking back, I sort of attribute my drug use to wanting to stay thin, not entirely, but in large part. I mean, there were a lot of things I liked about drugs other than the, the weight management aspects, but um, mm -hmm. certainly when I would consider quitting, the fact that I knew I would gain like 50 pounds if I quit um, mm -hmm. was definitely a weight on my mind. But, you know, so I'd quit using drugs, um, thank God, when I was 20 and then I was at UC Berkeley in my early 20s getting my my bachelor's and I, there's this anecdote of like I was trying I was going to a 12 step program for food I was trying to abstain from sugar and I would just periodically binge and and I I remember going down to a Mrs. Fields cookies that was right on Telegraph Avenue um you know right on the strip that leads right to UC Berkeley and I would just buy like you know like like 12 or 15 cookies. These are like cookies like this. And then I would go home and I would sit, hide from my roommate and sit in my room on the floor and just eat cookies until I just felt so sick. And um, there was a period of time during that time where my eating escalated to the point where I couldn't be without sugar. Like I had to have marshmallows stuffed in my coat pockets or M&Ms, you know, in my pockets so that I could like every few seconds just put one in my mouth because I couldn't, like I couldn't go five minutes without sugar. Um, I'd sit down to write a paper with a box of brown sugar and a spoon. Um, and I got straight A's, you know, like, um, when I was doing crystal meth, I had to drop out of high school cause that drug is not so supportive of, you know, living a functional life, but sh the sugar drug, um, you can kind of still function and, you know, be pretty badly hooked. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think w what's so interesting, and I know you bring this up, uh, in your book, which we're going to talk about is that that people can be so successful and so high functioning and, and have such, they can excel in so many uh, places within their lives. And yet so many people struggle to lose weight and keep it off. And I think in your book, you say this statistic is 1% of people who try and lose weight are actual, actually successful. Is that right? Yeah, that is. I mean, the, <clears throat> there's a couple studies that show it and it's of the obese. So someone in the obese category on the BMI chart, which isn't that hard. I mean, I was obese at 60 pounds heavier than I am right now. I'm obese and that's what I weighed. Um, so if you're obese and you try to lose weight in any given year, it's, it's actually quite a bit less than 1%. Actually, mm -hmm. you know, it's might maybe half a percent or something. Mm -hmm. We'll, we'll get to a normal BMI. Now in my program, most people end up at a BMI of like 21, 22. Um, and that's lower than just, just normal. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not, it's not underweight. It's just like in that sweet spot, the BMI range is really wide. Like mm -hmm. I would have to gain, I'm not sure exactly. I shouldn't st say a number, but I would have to gain quite a bit of weight to, to get out of the normal range. Like, you know, I could, I'm sure I could gain 15 pounds and still be normal, mm -hmm. maybe even 20 or 25. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So even, so, so even within that, we have a 99% failure rate. This is something yeah. that, that people want so badly. Yeah. People, you know, try multiple times. Right. Um, yeah. Very people who have so much control and success in other areas of their life. And kind of what I attribute a bit of this to is this, we have this cultural narrative that the strategy to lose weight is you need to eat less and you need to work out more. Like whenever right. any of my friends are on a diet or they decide that this is the time that they're going to lose weight, that's kind of the strategy that people go for. Um, and that is 
something that's really attracted me to your work is that you present yeah. an alternative to that. And there's <laughs> yeah. a reason why, why, that, yeah. why there's so much failure in that. So, yeah. so talk to me about this different strategy. Talk to me about the yeah. willpower gap. What is it yeah. that, that America and the world is missing in their attempts to lose weight? Yeah, yeah. Eat less, you can't, and exercise more, you shouldn't, <laughs> basically. Um, yeah, so you can't eat less because the brain is hounding you for more food. You've got all the physiological markers for starvation on board, and you can't eat less because um, all the cues around you are sucking you in to eat all the time. And unfortunately, the part of the brain that would rein you back from that is going on vacation because you've just used it up by checking your email or, you know, trying to deal with your kids or all the things that, you know, sitting in traffic, all the things we have to do in the modern pace of life. Um, so, so the brain issue, that, that brain issue is called the willpower gap. That's what I call it, the willpower gap. So it's the idea that the part of the brain that pulls in our impulses, the anterior cingulate cortex, that cingular cortex um, is exhausted by the things we're doing in life. Um, including making decisions, which is checking email, regulating our emotions, which is being with our kids. And um, it it is then incapacitated. It will not show up for us. So our our lifestyles these days are predicated on the idea that food is a catch-as-catch-can kind of thing. We're just going to sort of go, like, leave our house with no idea of where or what we're going to eat, except maybe we've got some regular lunch spots that we hit or something near our work or some such, right? Um, but but we don't know in advance where we're going, right? So we leave our house with no food with us and no idea where we're going to get our food. And then we just kind of go procure it um, through the day. And, you know, Brian Wansink, who's a, a professor at Cornell University, he did a study showing that we make 221 food-related choices every day. Well, that's a problem. You know, if, if you've got the willpower gap on board, you know, at least a couple of those choices are going to involve a vending machine or a drive through or, you know, a donut box in the snack, you know, the teacher's lounge or whatever. Mm-hmm. So, um, so, the, so, the, so the issue here is that it's not that we need to know what to eat and what not to eat. A lot of diet books are like, here's the thing. You got to do an elimination diet and give up. So you got to give up this. And, and like, I'm fine with that. You want to go paleo. You want to do an elimination. Fine. I'm like. How are you going to actually do that, though, over the long term? Like how how are your brain isn't on board with you making that choice on Friday night? Your brain is on board with ordering a pizza on Friday night. Mm. Like that's what your brain is going to that's what you're going to actually do. So I get I help people to actually manage the execution over the long term because that's the issue. Exactly. Yeah. We always think that, oh, it's going to be this this new diet is going to do it for me or this new superfood or this, you know, new whatever it is. But we have all the information. Like we know, like so many people that still struggle yeah. with this, we know exactly what we should be eating. Yeah. Broccoli and not donuts is not hard. <laughs> like it's really yeah. not, you know? It's really not. Yeah. And in one of yeah. your videos, you you talk about this. I mean, it's almost like this cruel joke really where our modern yeah. lives are set up in this way yeah. where we're just depleting our willpower. We're, de- we're depleted by all these decisions that we have to make. And so, you know, we sit down New Year's and we make this plan. We're like, okay, I, you know, my, what I, most deeply want for myself is to feel like I'm living my right life in my right body, you know, to, to take charge of my health, to be in control. You know, we have, we, we make these plans for ourselves and then the point of execution, you know, we just had this crazy long week. We worked 60 hours. We finally get home Friday night, we walk in the door and then like at that moment we have to try and decide what we're going to eat. You know, we have to try and align that particular choice with this bigger value of what we really want for our lives. And our, our willpower just doesn't exist at that point. No, it, right. It doesn't show up for us at that moment. It definitely doesn't. And, and, and this is where exercise makes it worse. Because if you worked out that morning, like you were supposed to at the gym, um, you burned up your willpower to get there. You burned up your willpower with whatever it was that you did while you were there. And then you created a brain that wanted more food afterwards and that that would easily fall for the compensation effect where it's going to talk you into making some kind of exception. Like, well, or, but, you know, hey, I worked out every day this week and your brain is demanding that food. That w- Exercise makes it so much worse. So, um, yeah, it takes everything you've got to learn how to eat the right way. Um, that's a full-time job for a little bit. And adding exercise to, the, to that mix is, in my opinion, one of the major reasons why people are not losing their excess weight is because they're trying to exercise at the same time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I think exercise later. 
draft your thin. <laughs> like I want to write a book called Don't Exercise Yet. Like get thin and then start to exercise. There's good research that exercise helps you keep off weight. Exercise is worthless for weight loss. Like go ask one of the best exercise um, scientists around at Louisiana State University, quote, exercise is pretty useless for weight loss. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Doesn't yeah, help. Right. And if we look at it, it this hurts. way, I mean, I kind of, I feel like the game is, so you start out with this initial motivation where you want to change and then you have a certain arc of, for that motivation and you have to use every ounce of that motivation to create the support and the healthy habits and just exactly the habits. Yeah. Totally. And to, yeah. to, to put those good choices on autopilot so mm-hmm. that you don't have to use your willpower to make the good choices. And if exactly. you can establish those habits before the motivation runs out, then it's a then different, good. It's a different exactly. game. Exactly. Uh-huh. Exactly. And, and like that arc isn't even going to get you there. So you need like support and like you need a, a system that's actually going to kind of like slant that curve in your favor a little bit. Because mm-hmm. right. like just you on your own, like you're not going to get there. Right. Yeah. Cool. So yeah, yeah. Let's, let's shift gears. So, so now we understand why everybody fails. Because the, the way that we try is so, yeah. it's just really not in alignment with what we know about psychology and willpower and neuroscience. So what, what is the alternative? So if we have a 99% failure rate, if someone yeah. really wants to do this and they want to do it right, using yeah. all the tools that we have, everything that we know, uh, what, what's the strategy? Yeah, well, they come to me and they do bright line eating. They do my bright line eating boot camp because we've kind of packaged it up. It is a whole system. Like this is a tough nut to crack. Um, but so what we're going to teach them is, um, first of all, foods are super addictive. Sugar and flour are the addictive foods. You're going to get those out entirely like quitting smoking. Like just a, that's the, the bright line in bright line eating is that clear boundary that you never cross. So sugar's out, flour's out. Um, take a deep breath, everyone. I know it's so scary when your heart plummets, if your heart plummeted, or your gut plummeted when I said that, and then you thought about all the foods that meant not eating anymore, just know that that's dopamine downregulation talking in your nucleus accumbens. It's the fact that your brain is wired to only get enough pleasure and satisfaction in life if you're rushing it with sugar and flour. And I just want you to know it doesn't take that long for those receptors to grow back. And so you will get plenty of happiness and satisfaction from your food and your life without sugar and flour, I promise you. But feeling bleak right now when you contemplate it is normal. It's really normal. How long does um, that take but, typically? Do you have a sense of that? We terms? don't have research on that in humans. I have a sense. Um, it varies based on how bad the damage was and probably based on genetic factors that affect you know, synaptic rewiring and neuroplasticity in the brain. But um, I, you know, the, the down regulation of the nucleus accumbens is the primary driver of cravings. And so for example, in our population of boot campers, some 50% are experiencing um, few to no cravings after a week. Um, that goes up to 84% by the end of the eight-week boot camp. Um, I think it's 3 to 5% report high, steady cravings throughout. So by the end of eight weeks, they've gotten no relief. Hmm. Um, so it really depends on the degree of depletion. One of the research programs I want to uh, – studies that I want to do is to do some fMRI work um, – with people who've got really bad dopamine depletion, image their brain before, image their brain in, you know, a long time, uh, you know, in time, you know, two weeks, four weeks, eight weeks, whatever, and and watch what it looks like, see how long it takes. Mm. But there will be individual differences for sure. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so, um, okay. yeah. So sugar and flour are out. We're going to teach you to eat three meals a day instead of snacking and grazing. Um, because three meals a day are automatizable, like, you know, Breakfast can be hardwired into your morning routine. Dinner can be hardwired into your evening routine. Lunch, there's still kind of some notion of a stopping point for people midday in our crazy society. Um, And then every other bite of food becomes a no thank you moment. And that's a really easy phrase to learn. Um, So, you know, we get a system going. We're, We're trying to make eating like teeth brushing, something that takes no effort, willpower, motivation, special mood, like nothing, just takes it takes it out of the realm of like, I got to f- solve this problem and into the realm of I execute that every day. Like, a, I don't know if I can swear on your program, so I'm not <laughs> going to, uh, like a, like a ninja. I execute that every day, like a ninja, like no issues with executing, you know, I know that 5% of the people have a problem executing teeth brushing twice a day. So if you're one of those 5%, I apologize, but most of us get that one for free every day with no cognitive load at all. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, 
Yeah, we're going to teach you how to plan your food the night before. Yeah, we're going to we're going to hook you up with a support system, give you an emergency action plan for when you have cravings. We're going to teach you how to get back and and simply resume when you get off track. Like we're going to teach you so much in that boot camp. It's a whole system. Like it's not one thing. I mean, even like making your bed in the morning is part of it. Like there's a whole a morning routine, an evening routine. We're going to change your whole life. Like you're mm-hmm. going to just become a different person. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and one thing I really want to highlight about that, which I think is is absolutely the right approach to this, is to think about automaticity, like putting your health and your health, your healthy choices, your healthy habits on autopilot. You know, it from from someone who has struggled with this their whole life, it can sound like this crazy thing where you know it's like, oh, that that that's that's a myth that can't really happen. Um, but it it really it really does become that simple. And when you create the guidelines, you create the framework, and you build those habits into the f- the fabric of your day to day, then it really does become possible for it to become automatic. It does it does? And uh, automaticity is such an important word. I like the word automatizable. I like to think about what's automatizable inherently. Certain things like three meals a day really automatizable. Six meals a day not so much. Not just think about the unwieldiness of trying to like imagine if your doctor said you need to brush your teeth, teeth six times a day mm-hmm. and floss six times a day. Like just think about the load that would cause in your life, like how hard it would be to remember to do it all the time. Right. So, you know, it, when we're talking about getting the food right, you want to be thinking about what's automatizable. Mm-hmm. Cool. Um, I want to talk about this for hours, but I know we, <laughs> we don't have that much time. Um so can we fast forward a little bit and maybe you can talk to me about uh, the results that you've seen. Um, so the, my brother's mother-in-law is one of your boot campers. Um, oh. she's, she's seen really awesome results in the program. Brother's mother-in-law, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Yep, and I, I got her on the phone a little bit before this interview just to check in with her and hear how everything's going and it's going really well for her. Um, cool. So it's, that's a really cool personal note to add. Um, talk to me about some of the data. Uh, what are you seeing in terms of results? Um, well, um, our program so far is 280 times more successful than any other program in getting people into a right size body and helping them stay there. Um, now it, it, that's maybe an understatement because I don't think there's any other program at all that has documented getting a cohort of people to a right, into a right size body. And I'm not talking about like, there's a pu- paper published by Weight Watcher or it, yeah, about Weight Watchers that looked at their, um, lifetime members and like of the cohort of 600 and some odd lifetime members, five years out, 16% of them were still at that weight. But then the weight was a BMI of 27.1, which is over. Like I'd have to gain 50 pounds to, mm. to have that BMI. Like that's not a slender, right? Like that's – I was in hell in my body at 50 pounds heavier than I am now. So um, bariatric surgery, same thing. Like they count a success as you know helping someone to lose a tiny fraction of the total – weight that they need to lose, you know, like less than half of the total. If they can just, you know, they needed to lose 300 pounds. If they can just lose a hundred pounds of that, they call that a success, right? So, um, our program is the most successful weight loss program on earth. And, um, so some of it, but it doesn't work for everybody and not everybody, you know, not everybody succeeds. So 20% of people get a refund from the boot camp right away. They're like, this is not, well, not right away, but like within the span of the refund window, 20% are out the door. Um, so it's not a fit for everybody, right? I mean, and that's fair. It's a boot camp. Like it's, it's not easy, right? People go home mm-hmm. from boot camp. Um, and is, there, and, is do yeah. you have a sense of how people can make that evaluation? Like, is, is there a personality type that this doesn't work for? Well, yes. I mean, some people have proposed that there's abstainers and and um, moderators. Is that the term? I think like some people really like a black and white approach to things, and some people like to, you know, not do it that way. Mm-hmm. So people may, might have a sense of whether they like the idea of just giving something up cold turkey. I mean, I would argue that if your brain is highly susceptible, and I do have a quiz that tells people whether they have a susceptible brain or not to to the pull of food addiction. Um, like my my brain's ridiculous. I'm a 10 out of 10. Um, um, one of my best friends is a one on that scale. Several of my best friends are ones on that scale, actually. Um, if your brain is high, um, you know, you can not like the idea of a bright line solution, but I would argue that you're not going to have much peace without it, right? Mm -hmm. If you've got a brain that's hounding you, and you're experiencing wicked cravings and you're obsessed with food all the time. Like I use the bright lines cause they give me peace and freedom. Like I'm happy and free. I'm not, I'm not like 
gnashing my teeth every day about the cookies I'm not getting to eat. Like I'm over it already. It's like Mm -hmm. I quit smoking a long time ago. You know, I'm not, you know, if anyone's ever quit smoking, they get it. Like it's, it's hard, but it's so doable. And then once you've done it, you have so much freedom. Mm -hmm. Oh, I forget what your question was, but anyway, (laughs) I I said a whole bunch of other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to imagine from being, being in the point where you are, addicted to something or if you have a certain pleasure like like for me i'm totally addicted to coffee right now this is the first time that's ever happened within 30 years um so i have a oh, serious wow. i have a serious coffee addiction at the moment I'm yeah okay go in public with that yeah um, <laughs> that's cool i've been there i've been yeah. there matt i get it i get it matt yeah yeah um, i think I, i'm counting actually i think i'm 92 days off caffeine uh, so i get a, it that's awesome um and being in this place of being addicted or having this like pleasure that I don't want to give up. It's so hard to imagine the alternative, but once you've made that jump, it's so much better and you're so free and you just can't even imagine what it was like to be back in that right. place. And it's like two worlds, it right? Is. It's like, it's like you, you switch into a whole different world. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the, the, the free world is easy. Like without it at all, it, the, the hard world is where you're trying to straddle the line and go back mm-hmm. and forth, which that's the, that's the hell world. Exactly. Like, so when people say like, oh, it's so rigid, no, you know, you can't even, not even on, the, I'm like, you're trying to get me to live in hell land. Like the, <laughs> like the, the one cookie experiment does not go well no. for me. I'm telling you, <laughs> yeah. you know, the small serving of ice cream never, you know, never panned out very well for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So in terms of so so I could definitely see that maybe being a way to distinguish in terms of of approaches if this might not be the right yeah. right approach for people. So you're saying twenty percent of people get a refund, and then in terms of of the success rate. Yeah. So our our program in the form it is now is two and a half years old. Our first people did the boot camp two and a half years ago. Our um, so most of the people started the boot camp within the last year and a half started the bootcamp with it. So we have our big bolus of people, like a lot of them are still losing their excess weight. Someone came into the bootcamp in October of 2015 at 350 pounds. They're still losing weight. Mm -hmm. So um, we don't have final numbers on the percentage that get down to goal weight. I can tell you, I have to flip through my book. You know what? You're, you're quizzing me here. This is my book, <laughs> Bright Line Eating, The Science of Living Happy, Thin, and Free. And right at the end, I, I think it's 84% of people who are getting down to goal weight are still there. 84%. That's I believe. That's awesome. 84% are still there. Yeah. And um, okay. So after the boot camp ends, 84% of respondents maintain their weight loss or continue to maintain. 87%. 87% after the boot camp keep losing weight or maintain their weight loss. Within a year, 28% have arrived at goal weight, but a, a bunch more, uh, you know, the, the, the difference between that 28% and that 87%, they're still losing. Um, at goal weight on average, the group has lost 25% of their top weight. So if they started at 160 pounds, they'd get down to 120. Um, many lose much more, obviously, and 84% are still of those who reach goal weight, 84% are still there. So those are our numbers so far. Mm, And we do have a long-term follow-up study with, you know, I think close to 2000 people in it now. Um, and we're still tracking them and, you know, we are right now, there's no program on earth that that has results like that. Like Mm -hmm. right now we are the most successful weight loss program on earth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. I, I, like I said, I've been a fan for a long time and I've been following you for a long time and purely because of this, because in, you know, the whole goal of getting healthy, losing weight, taking control of our health, taking control of our life is really about, it's about willpower. It's about healthy habits. It's about, about automating this stuff and building it into the fabric of our life. Like that's really my, my key message that I try and share with people and the way that you explain it and your scientific understanding of it and, uh, the program that you've built around that I feel like is is such a fantastic example and such a fantastic model for people. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to get you on the phone and have you explain it to us and share some of your results with us because I think it's Thank really fantastic. You, yeah. Um, so awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you for everything that you've done. Um, and let's do a little uh, pitch for your new book. So we're going to aim to release this Yay. on March 21st. Yeah, the day, the day it comes, it comes out. out. I so. have this in advance, but it's being published on March 21st. You can get it at Barnes & Noble today. Yay, yeah, go everybody and buy it. Go to Amazon. 
Yes, yeah. and I, I have looked and I haven't seen such a good overview of the science behind this stuff. And in this, mm. the time that we've had, we've just been able to really scratch the surface. Um, yeah. But for anybody who's, in, who's interested in, in losing weight in particular, I totally recommend this approach. Um, for anyone who's interested in changing their life and taking charge of their health, um, this, this is the stuff. This is the stuff that works. This is what we need to learn. And this is what we need to imbue into our cultural narrative as well so that people don't keep trying the wrong way because we really, we really got to turn the ship around. Thank you. It's so true, Matt. We do. We collectively do. And there's some nuggets here that are helpful for everybody, whether you've got a weight problem or not, like that not all brains are equally susceptible, you know? Mm. And so just because you can moderate your ice cream intake doesn't mean that everybody can. Literally, they, they, some people can't. And mm. so just understanding that. So we get to a point in the not too dear, distant future where when someone, it's Thanksgiving and someone passes up the pumpkin pie and says, no thanks, I don't eat sugar our response is like, oh, okay, cool. Just like we would say to someone who at New Year's Eve says, no, thanks, I don't, I don't drink to the mm -hmm. champagne. We go, Come on, dude, it's New Year's Eve. Like you're not going to drink some champagne on New Year's Eve. Like that would be a jerk move, right? Mm -hmm. exactly. But people will try to bully that person into eating pumpkin pie on Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. And we need to get over that because yeah. there, we are experiencing far too severe consequences over the food that we're putting on our mouth as a collective society. We mm -hmm. can't afford it no. anymore. No. So we need to, we need to change the way we think about food. That's mm -hmm. just one example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much for your work. Uh, we'll put a link to the quiz below this video. We'll put a link to the book. Um, Yay. and I Yay, very much look you. forward to getting my hands on a physical copy. It's going to be great. Awesome. And that quiz is so you, people can learn how their brain is susceptible, how susceptible their brain is to, to the pull of food. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Because, you know, one to 10. I'm a 10. Do you know where you are, Matt? Um, I took it. I think I was a six. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you're not a stranger, but you're not like, this doesn't have you by the throat. Uh -huh, exactly. Yeah. I get a sense yeah. like, oh, this is, this is a little yeah. scary. <laughs> yeah, totally. This could be really bad. <laughs> yeah, totally. Uh -huh. Right. And if you had a weight problem, which a lot of people who are sixes do, it might become more imperative that you would need a bright line approach. Like if you don't have a weight or a health problem, a six can probably rock and roll with it, you mm -hmm. know? So that's the other thing is that the susceptibility scale doesn't line up perfectly with weights. There's a lot of people who are at a normal weight, but super food addicts mm -hmm. and vice versa. Not everybody who's obese is high on the susceptibility scale, you know? So that's where it's important to keep both in mind. And the, anyway, so go, everybody go take the quiz and and then I'll, t I'll teach you after that your best path to food freedom. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much. I hope we get to check in soon. And I good, would love that, Matt. Yeah, good luck with the book launch. Thank you so much. Great, to, right. great to be here. Yeah, take care.